Every second film we see is a fictional story of planetary and social catastrophe, and the appetite for these stories seems to be insatiable. But when it comes to facts and reality, people seem less interested in where we are and where we're going. A new paper presents a strongly worded way forward through six areas, six levels of action, and three timescales. So welcome, thanks for joining me. And in studio today, I've got Dr. Phoebe Barnard, who's um, a professor at the University of Washington. She's an associate at the University of Cape Town. She's the executive director of the Stable Planet Alliance. But more importantly, she's the co-lead author of the new paper that's just come out, which is World Scientists' Warnings into Action, Local to Global. Welcome. Um, Thank you. First of all, can you just give us a, a quick overview of what this paper is about? What the World Scientists Warning uh, into Action paper is about is a fundamental shift from what scientists have normally been intending to do, presenting dispassionate neutral facts and hoping that they'll be taken up and miraculously put into action. We are stepping beyond that normal mandate of scientists to strongly recommend key concrete actions at six different scales from local to global around the world in six areas and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute but it was a great paper with 15 um, top world scientists, economists and governance specialists from seven countries around the world real privilege to work with them. Okay and who's the intended audience for this? This uh, audience is intended specifically for decision makers and planners around the world at all levels from individual and household levels in other words everyone on earth uh, up through communities cities regions nations and global and we hope that there will be uh, a, a strong enough basis for everyone to have uh, things that they can grab onto to make changes to help achieve the very big transformative change that global society and civilization actually needs to make within the next eight years to 2030. Okay, um, and, and the title almost implies it being a bit more prescriptive than, than usual, is that the case? There has been throughout the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and a number of similar processes, uh, a kind of mantra that scientists engage in policy relevant but not policy prescriptive language. But I think, you know, it's pretty clear that that has not been enough. The world has not been acting on it. And so we are stepping outside of our good little scientists box and requesting that action be taken. So we are using more deterministic language, like um, we must rather than we could or we can, uh, that leaders should do this rather than that leaders could do this. And it may sound really pissy, but you know that's the language of the UN, words matter. And politicians, uh, need to feel uncomfortable about their lack of action and so we are trying to guide them comfortably but also hold them to task mm. for the work that needs to be done. But just as a general member of the, the, the population, the number of videos that I've seen that start off with belching chimneys and effluents pouring out of pipes and mm. Mm. you know after two minutes of watching that and then the narrative kicks in or the, 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 the cell kicks in I'm, I'm numbed already and I've seen it so many times. How, how do we cut through that numbness that, that people experience? And that's exactly what this paper intends to do. It's intended to cut through that um, weariness that so many of us have at hearing yet more scientific warnings. We are going beyond warnings, taking our former uh, six priorities that we identified back in 2019 in the paper World Scientist Warning of a Climate Emergency and we are now translating that into action at six levels across these six issues and with three timelines for urgent action between now and 2050. Okay. So can we jump in there and start going through those six sure. points? Sure. Uh, first of all, can you give us the six points and then chat a little bit about each one of them I'll ask you. Sure, so these date from our 2019 paper and we had identified six areas of uh, you know, urgent action for humanity. 
And I'll list them and then I'll briefly elaborate on them. They are energy, uh, pollutants, nature, food systems, population, and the economy. Energy, because we need to conserve energy dramatically and we need to transition to non-fossil fuel sources. Pollutants, because we have all these uh, atmospheric pollutants, emissions of greenhouse gases going up into the air. We need to stop those emissions or draw them way down. And we need to remove a lot of the um, greenhouse gases, in particular methane, which is so damaging to the climate. Thirdly, on nature, we need to conserve nature, absolutely, yes, and particularly old growth forests and other carbon rich ecosystems. But we also need to restore damaged ecosystems. Food systems, we need to return to a regenerative, much more um, circular kind of uh, agriculture that puts nutrients back in the soil and doesn't. Um, waste them to the air and then have to import fertilizers and so on. But people also need to start eating more economically and by that I mean um, eating less damaging foods like fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds and legumes and so on rather than very damaging um, foods like meat and dairy. And this will be a transition and there needs to be support for farmers while this is happening. Mm -hmm. Population, we need to stabilize our population through very ethical, education-based, women's, uh, women-focused, women's leadership-focused um, efforts to have small families and a healthy, sustainable population. And then finally, the economy, we need to convert from this rapacious, um, linear economy where we put raw materials in at the beginning and spew out waste at, at the end and convert that to a much more circular economy which contributes to real human well-being and planetary well-being rather than just being about private profits. We often find that what benefits people in the economy it accrues to a small number of private individuals at the cost of the great mass of humanity or the planet. I mean, one thing that struck me when I was reading the abstract of your paper was this uh, line, our biggest challenges are not technical, but social, economic, political, and behavioral. So it's not so much about the science in a way. I mean, we've, we're just yeah. about there with the science, aren't we? The science is really only a small part of the solution. What it has done is laid bare the clear and relentless facts but our solutions are within our own psyche, our greed, our tendency to procrastinate about problems. And they are economic problems, they are social problems, and they are problems of our political system. Mm. And until we make those changes across all of them to 2030 and 2050, we are just pissing into the wind to try to solve climate change, biodiversity loss, or even social equity issues. Hmm. And then if, I mean, if you look at what the US is going through with, with COVID, where there's a kind of a, an overall central government opinion about it, and each state and even counties within each state has got its own view of how to handle something, mm -hmm. the, the same applies to um, to what we're talking about here, where you've got countries that are kind of in, they've made commitments, other countries aren't interested for whatever reason. I mean, are people gonna to have to respond to consequences rather than policy? One good thing about having eight billion people on the planet is that there's enough people that are standing shoulder to shoulder for transformative change, that I think that we can face down the, uh, the, the backward looking old guard but it's going to be a little messy and we have to strap in our seat belts and prepare for it. Yeah. And just another parallel, I mean, as, as far as in the US, the political system where facts are being argued, argued against uh, conspiracy and alternative facts, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a similar, similar situation in, in, in science and climate. You can't argue conspiracy and non-facts. Well. People can and they do, but we have a choice as humanity. Are we going to go back to the Middle Ages of superstition and ignorance and conspiracy and uh, a, a willingness to attack intellectuals um, and, and attack people who stand for the common good? 
or are we going to choose that evidence-based society that's driven by logic and love and uh, you know com collective well-being mm. what would you consider to be a realistic win as uh, coming as a consequence of this paper I would love to see much more ambitious targets being set. We set out a number of explicit concrete uh, recommendations in the paper, especially under energy. Uh, there need to be more ambitious roadmaps, but particularly we need to start experimenting with some of the fundamental architecture of how we work. Um, in governments, for example, there are procedures and plans and compliance measures none of which are adequate for the task ahead. We cannot make bold transformative change with the kind of government that we're doing. So one thing that we need to start with, and we can't wait until it's done to move on with the other things, but we need to start with transforming the way governments can work so they can move rapidly. But also communities and individuals have a key role to play, and we certainly need to make uh, to, to undergo a process of re-evaluating our purpose in life, our goals for the future, and what kind of a society we want to have, and how do we get there? Now, you kind of answered it, but you know, most of these discussions around this subject usually end up with that one question, you know, what can I, as, a, as one grain of sand amongst eight billion other grains of sand on a beach, do to make a difference? Out of these six issues that we've spoken about, you know, energy, pollutants, nature, food systems, po population, and the economy, um, I think three are particularly in the purview of individuals to handle. Population, individuals can choose to have a small family or encourage their granddaughters to, uh, if they've already bred, they can encourage their granddaughters and their daughters to, and sons, to have smaller families and um, food systems. You know, people can choose to stop eating meat every day, but maybe have it as a really special treat. I mean, there are, there are societies that live in not, not very arable land that have yeah. to eat meat though, I guess. Absolutely. There are some cultures, some ecosystems for which that's neither practical nor adaptive. And acknowledging the deep traditional wisdom of rangeland and herder cultures at climate adaptation and their need to be able to eat meat is important. But the resource problem of the wealthy north and um, wealthy people everywhere of consuming too much, eating too much meat, that needs to be faced head on. So uh, the, the third issue that people and communities can generally have a big effect on is nature and nature and soil conservation with community food gardens that, for example, balance uh, pollinator habitat, food production, and uh, carbon recycling into the soil through composting. Right. I get that was really insightful. Thanks for giving us an insight into the paper and I just hope the penny drops <laughs> in enough of these areas with people that either are complacent, don't give a damn, don't believe it, that, that there's a change in, as you say in your abstract, uh, it's not so much about the uh, technical and the science but about the behavioural, economic, political and social. There are two things I'd just like to add before we go. One is that it's easy for people to get despondent if they're not engaged in action. And, and two, um, this paper is now open for co-signature. Anyone with a degree, not just in natural sciences, but in political, social, economic, health, legal, education, sciences, can all sign this paper. So please go to the Scientists Warning Europe uh, website and I'll give you the link to go and sign the paper. Thank you so much, John. Great, no, thank you.